I'm certainly glad to be here tonight at UHV. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. I uh, came to talk about the gallery furniture story. I also came to talk about the American dream, which is something I firmly believe in. And uh, my message is real simple. Whatever I have done in my career, you can do better. My son-in-law works for Baker Hughes. He has a very good job. He asked me last week what I would do different in my career, and my answer was not a thing. And uh, could I do it all over again? Absolutely. I think the best days of the uh, free enterprise system in the United States are in front of us, not behind us. I think it's a great time to be in Houston, a great time to be in Sugarland, a great time to be in Fort Bend County, and a great time to be an entrepreneur. That said, I will now launch into this semi-brilliant dissertation. <laughs> However, let me give you a little bit of my less than illustrious background, so hopefully you know where I'm not headed to. You see, I was doing real well about 34 short years ago. I was 28 years old, living at home in my folks in Dallas, where I grew up at, and I had kind of a menial job. I was sacking groceries, making about three bucks an hour. And there's nothing wrong with sacking groceries, nothing wrong with making a minimum wage, but I kind of felt with my college education, my background, maybe I should be doing something a little better than that. Anyway, I had a bad attitude. <laughs> And the name of that convenience store I was working at was located in a rough neighborhood there in Northeast Dallas. The name of that convenience store it was called a Stop and Rob. <laughs> One day, the boss walked in, looked up at me, said, Son, he said, Son, you got a bad attitude. And I said, uh, uh, Yes, sir, I know it's here, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to change this. So I'm to help me change it. And the thoughts raised through my mind how is this man going to help me change? A raise, a promotion, what's it going to do for me? I said, Sir, I said, That's fair. He said, I can help me change. And he said, Boy, you're fired. <laughs> I said, oh, no, and I went home at night to my folks' house. Went into the depression for several weeks. I felt sorry for myself. I felt like I was a victim of circumstances. Anyway, I went into the depression for several weeks. And, you know, I felt like I was entitled to a nice home, nice car, nice job without really having to work for it. So I woke up here early one Sunday morning, several weeks later, stumbled in my folks' house where the television was. I turned the television on. There was a religious program on this Sunday morning. I really wasn't great religion on the television, but the preacher was preaching the message, so I decided that I'd watch for a while. I turned the television on, and lo and behold, there he was looking me right in the eye. His name was Oral Roberts. <laughs> I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, students here today at UHP, that a miracle happened that Sunday morning. You see, the miracle was that Sunday morning, Oral Roberts was not asking for any money. <laughs> I told this story, tell us about 10 years ago, and that joke didn't go very well. <laughs> Didn't go very damn well here either, but anyway. <laughs> we have preached a message. The message was that the greatest challenge that we all have from our Creator is to use our talents. He looked at me and to the television and he said, he said, you know, there's a lot of you out there in television land today that are throwing your lives away. He said, you're wallowing in the throes of self-pity. He said, get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. And that was a seminal watershed event in my life. I remember it like it was yesterday. He said, get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. So I decided to take his advice and do just that. And I went up the next day and got a job at a small furniture store in Dallas. And the problem was that furniture was located about 30 miles from my parents' house. And I had no car. So I got up and rode the bus out there two hours one way and two hours back. But you know, you do what you have to do and you enjoy the price. You don't pay the price. And... I began to read some books like Thinking You Were Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Magic of Blue, by Colin Crystal. And I began to reprogram my mind. And I found something I was good at. I was good at retailing. I was good at entrepreneurship. After about 18 months, I began to dream of maybe having my own location. However, I didn't want to open a furniture store up there in Dallas. So people, my boss had taught me the business. So I asked him in the late 1980s where it would be a good place to start a furniture store somewhere in Texas other than Dallas. He said, kid, I understand you the boom town. Try Houston. At that time, my brother George down here in Houston, a real estate business. So I called him up one night, late one night. I said, George, it's Mac. I'm thinking about moving to Houston to get the furniture business. I said, see if you can find me a location. He said, Mac, he said, I'll see what I can do. He called me back about three weeks later. He said, Mac, I got your loca location. I said, well, uh, great, George, where is it? And he said, 6006 I, 45 North Street, Jimbo Park. <laughs> you got to watch old time Houston television. <laughs> I said, hey, that sounded like a good deal. I said, Simon Jefferson, he did. And I went out to dinner that night with a little girlfriend. Her name was Linda. 
She had voices through all my ups and downs. She got a car that night. I was all excited. I said, I got great news for tonight. She said, what's that, Mac? I said, we're going to move to his front to get the furniture business. She said, there ain't no way. I said, let me understand something. We're going to move to his front to get the furniture business. We just might be successful. She said, look, Mac, you don't understand something. She said, all my friends live here in Dallas, went to school here, got a good job, and not going to be used to not getting the perks business with you. Well, I learned you're going to be successful in business and life. Above all, you have to be persistent. Never give up. Like that. Good job. <laughs> uh, you got to be persistent. So I kept asking her that night and asking her and asking her. And uh, got one of those quicker. No clicker. Okay, so anyway, after about 40 times, 40 times, she got very frustrated with me asking her to move to Houston with me. She finally slammed her hand on the dashboard. She said, I'll tell you what, Mac. She said, I'll move to Houston. I'll get the furniture business with you. But you're going to have to marry me first. <laughs> I got to think of myself as a woman put me on a difficult decision. <laughs> But then I came up with what I considered to be an entrepreneurial brainstorm. I thought to myself, uh, where else can I get an employee this cheap? I said, you got a deal. <laughs> so we moved to Houston April 1981. We only had $5,000. And all of her friends and neighbors and relatives, they said we'd never make it. Said we were undercapitalized, which we certainly were. Didn't know anybody in Houston, which we didn't. Didn't have any contacts in the furniture business. And they gave a list of laundry lists of Many, many times why we would fail, but you know I had the same unfair advantage that everybody in this room has. And that unfair advantage is called desire. And I'm firmly convinced you can go where you want to go, do what you want to do, and be what you want to be. The only thing limiting you is how bad you want to do it. And my wife and I came down to this wonderful place called Houston, and this wonderful market, and nobody asked us how much money we had. Nobody asked me how I ever run a furniture store before. Nobody said, uh, what's your qualifications? All that Texas and the free enterprise system said to me and said to my wife Linda was, kid, here's a chance for you. A chance to succeed, a chance to fail. It's totally up to you how bad you want to do it. And here we are, 32 years later. Back, go back to where we started that way. Broke and hungry. <laughs> That's how I started, broke and hungry. You know, it's a wonderful thing about entrepreneurship. When you start broke and hungry, you can't make any mistakes. <laughs> because you make any mistakes, you're out of business. And uh, I can't tell you how many business ventures I've had since then. I had money and they all went broke. <laughs> Thank God I'm in the furniture business. We were broke and hungry and... Uh, our motto has always been from day one, if it is to be, it's up to me, so last week. First couple of years we sold low end furniture, we did very, very well. Uh, started with nothing, built the business up. Uh, next slide, please. And this was our building. This was our original building starting in April 1981 on the North Freeway in Houston, Texas. This was five abandoned model homes. These homes have been condemned by the city of Houston. They hadn't been occupied for four or five years when we took the occupancy of that building. And it was lived in by vagrants. There was no water and no bathroom, so imagine what the house looked like. My wife came down here about three weeks before I did with the, her friend, and they cleaned these areas up and made it happen. And this is where we ran the furniture store for the first 20 years, out of these buildings. Had no air conditioning, no heating. The roofs leaked, leaked like a sieve, but you know, we found a way. And we made hundreds of million dollars in sales out of these buildings right here. So you don't have to have a lot of money, you don't have to have a fancy building. All you have to have is a product that you can wait for the life of the customers. And that's what we did for the first 20 years. Next slide. This is the uh, building, the new fancy store we built in 2000. This is the main showroom behind there where the uh, tracks are, or the warehouse that was uh, built later. We bulldozed all of this, that is the current store now. The Golden Age Gallery Furniture was certainly the uh, 2000 to 2007. The business was booming. We were making lots of profits. And uh, we had one store, incredible, the most highest sales per square foot furniture store in history. Uh, and we did very well. Then all of a sudden came September of 2008, Paris Turns. 
Bear Stearns filed for bankruptcy. They put him right out of business. And the uh, subprime loan crisis collapsed, crashed the housing market in the Houston area. in uh, September of 2008 was our worst month in, in many years. And the uh, battle for survival was on as the housing starts in Houston went down 66%. Things got a little better, and in 2009, uh, the economy was on the uptick. Best economy in the country, in Houston and Fort Bend County. And so 2009, we decided to expand for our first time ever, and we got a second location on uh, Post Oak and Westheimer, right in the prime shopping area of the state of Texas. It was a great 25,000 square foot location. We opened this in February of 2009, and had great plans to expand the business and have a great year in 2009. One of the things I'd like to talk about tonight and next is prepare for setbacks. In your career and mine, the one thing that is for sure is you're going to have setbacks all the way. And they're going to knock you down. And the question is whether or not you get up. I was at Gallery Furniture on May 21st, 2009. I was at the front desk. And I got a call from the warehouse manager. I picked up the phone. He said, the warehouse is on fire. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. Within 15 minutes, the entire place incinerated. The giant steel beams in that warehouse just wilted like a, uh, a, a, a cheap uh, umbrella. And the heat was 2,000 degrees in there. The fire was started by an arsonist. And we sustained about $25 million of damage. My wife, my two daughters, and I sat there and watched that place burn to the ground. It was extremely painful to watch our life history burn to the ground, not knowing what we were going to do. But, you know, we were rallied and, and, and our spirits were lifted by our incredible employees who went on and said, let's all gather hands and make a big circle and we prayed for faith at midnight. And we decided that we were going to go on. We decided to turn this uh, tragedy into a triumph. We got on the cell phones at 1 o'clock in the morning, that Friday morning, and we called our suppliers across the country, ordering truckloads of furniture, begging them to get them there on Friday so we could sell it. We didn't know anywhere where we were going to put the furniture. We had no warehouse. The warehouse was burned down. The store was totally smoke and water damaged. But we had the post oak store, and we were not going to lay off any employees, and we were going to go on. The next day, Friday, I had two speeches, one at noon at Clear Lake High School, and I had a commencement to address that night at West Ray Christian High School. They both called me about 10 o'clock and said, you're canceling, aren't you? I said, nope, that's not who I am. That's not what I do. I will be there. And back then, my incredible uh, wife, who is the picture book poster child of tenacity, found us a warehouse in Sugarland, Texas at 3 o'clock that afternoon. The warehouse was totally filled with cantilevered racks and lift trucks. We moved, moved in at 3 o'clock, unloaded 20 trucks that day, delivered $200,000 worth of furniture the day of the fire. And our incredible employees rallied, and we didn't have to look back since then. We turned that tragedy into a triumph. Sales obviously went down in June of 2000, uh, that year, 2009. And then uh, started coming back uh, gradually and slowly moving back up, and now we're back in full swing in 2013. Uh, have a very good year so far this year. Looking forward to opening a, a location right over here in uh, Sugarland in uh, May of 2014. So thanks for looking up. One of the things I suggest to everybody in the room is when you graduate from UHB as an undergraduate or a uh, MBA or when you get your PhD, that's when life learning starts, not finishes. I was blessed to have parents who taught me to be a lifelong learner. So I read all the time. I'm always trying to learn something. My mentor, W. Edwards Demi, was the man who MacArthur sent to Japan after World War II to rebuild the economy of this island nation of 170 million people. Dr. Deming went over there and helped rebuild their economy and this island nation of 170, people, 170 million people created these great firms like Toyota, Toshiba, and Sony that Dr. Deming helped them create. And uh, 
they became the number two economy in the world, an island nation of 170 million people. Dr. Deming taught me to continue to learn. When Dr. Deming, one of my life's mentors, died, he died when he was 93 years old. As he lay in bed dying, his daughter was reading from a book to him so he could continue to educate his mind, talking about practice what you preach. And I read this book in the Wall Street Journal, they had learned about it, I read the book by this guy named Jonathan Burns called Islands of Prophet and the Sea of Red Ink. And it made this audacious, audacious claim that 40% of your business is unprofitable and how to fix it. I knew that didn't apply to us. Maybe I thought we had 10% of our business was unprofitable, certainly not 40%. But I read the book and I got interested in the guy, so I called him at his office. He teaches at MIT. And I said, uh, Mr. Burns, my name is Jim McAbill in Houston. I want to talk to you about doing some consulting for us. He said, well, I don't really know who you are. He said, but let me check on things and I'll get back to you in a couple of days. Well, it just so happened that night that uh, his best friend from college was staying with him at his house in Boston. His best friend from college teaches at the University of St. Thomas. So he told him who Matthew Smack was, and he came down and started working with him. And here's what happened. He showed us how we could achieve a 20% yearly growth by using the precepts in his book, and a 50% increase in profitability in the first year, 2013, this year. I thought it was impossible, but I took a leap of faith, and here's what happened. He taught us about islands of profit, where you make money. Palm trees, one off of this, where you make lots of money. Coral reefs and minerals, minerals where you lose money. These are the analogies he uses. So we started looking at the business from a different lens, and here's what happened. The truth. An inside glance at the numbers of gallery furniture. Gallery furniture by product. Minnow product. 87% of the products we carry are minnows. On those 87% of the products we carry, we lost 24%. Uh, profit on them. On the coral reef products, we lost a whopping 40%. So we lost 64% of the store of profits. And on these other two categories, palm trees and islands of profit, we made 6.5% six, six, six of the total mix. In other words, 6.5% of the products were palm trees and, and uh, islands of profit. We made 164% profit on those. We gave the other 64% back on the non profit items. I thought I'd never looked at it that way. What an insight. Gallery furniture by vendors. Ninety-six percent of the vendors were unprofitable. Four and a half percent of the vendors were profitable. So it wasn't eighty-twenty Pareto principle. It was five to ninety-five. An amazing story. Next, please. Customers. We found out that fifty-four percent of our customers we were losing money on. Uh, plus twenty-seven percent on uh, the islands of profit. We're making one hundred thirty-five percent. So. Right there is where all the money was on 17% of the customers in the store. What an opportunity to segment. What an opportunity to target. What an opportunity to grow the business. And uh, Jonathan taught us that our core competency was not to delight every customer, which is what we'd always thought it was. He said our core competency was instead to sell to islands of profit customers, to retain these islands of profit customers, and to recruit new islands of profit customers to sell, to retain, and to recruit the people where we make the most profit on. Because, if you walk in Gallery Furniture North Freeway, you see a big marquee, a theater sign. It says, we need freedom to shape our future. We need profit to remain free. We need freedom to shape our future. We need profit to remain free. It comes from the handbook, M&M Mars. The, one of the largest league held private companies in the world. They make M&Ms and other things that I'm suffering for. <laughs> This is how it breaks out. We got down to the granular level. What is the cost of the ticket in addition to the cost of the furniture? And what he taught us that each line out of the ticket costs $150. On this ticket, for instance, we lost $300. In other words, we got cost of sale, cost of merchandise, retail price, and then we've got personnel, we've got advertising, we've got insurance, we've got air conditioning, we've got trucks, we've got diesel, we've got eight million other expenses. So now we know that every line item costs us $150. This ticket looks very good. We sold it for $3,500. We made uh, the uh, cost of the merchandise was $1,750, so we made 50% markup on it. That looks like a really good ticket. Then you add up the 15 line items, that comes to uh, 20, 
$100 extra cost to handle all that merchandise, and all of a sudden that profitable ticket goes to $500 loose. Next. You look at the better quality merchandise, this one has three line items on it, we made $1,280 on it. The next one has uh, five or six line items, we made $3,000 on it. So it gave us a whole new way of looking at the business, figuring out how we're going to make more profits so we grow the business for the stakeholders, which are the community, the employees, and the vendors. Next. Ten difficult questions as we go forward in gallery furniture. We can either change and grow the business or we can go out of business. Because they, when I came here in 1981, there was maybe 30 furniture stores in the area. Now there's probably 1,000 and there's 25,000 places you can buy furniture on the internet. We better change. How are we going to consistently achieve that 20% yearly growth and the 50% increased profits? Here's how. Number one, know thyself. Be insatiably curious. We had to look at this uh, Pareto principle. We had to calculate and determine which 20% of the SKUs do 8% of the business. 20% of the merchandise does 80% of the business. In our case, 4.4% of the merchandise does 95% of the business. And uh, how do we, uh, we're going to pare down the inventory. Our store has always been very, very crowded, like a Walmart, and it does appeal to better quality customers. You have to curate the inventory, like you do with restoration hardware, to appeal to a better quality customer. Next. Customer base. How do we attract the fluent customers who agree with our core values, integrity, community, same day delivery? How do we attract customers that agree with our core values? If gathered furniture attracts the right customers, customers are happier because the merchandise is relevant to their needs. When you walk into Restoration Hardware, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get baby sofas and uh, reclaimed wood furniture. But the people love it. They know what they're going to get. We have to be more targeted in our, in our approach rather than being one size fits all. We've got to be targeted like the Apple Store. A lot of people hate them. A lot of people love them. 50 billion a year, they're not doing bad. <laughs> Next. Salespeople are happier interacting with customers who are more apt to buy and have the means to buy. We're going to attract the right customers. This is a very telling map. Where are the out of profit customers buying out of profit uh, products and providing 80% of the profits? Where the dark green places are. Where the dark green places are is where we want to be. Uh, right here, Sugarland, Green, Cave, uh, 290, Woodlands, Spring, Kingwood and uh, post up and that's where we need to be. How do we attract those people? That's where our growth is. That's how we grow the business. Target the customers who live in the dark green areas. Birds of a feather, of course, flock together. Logistic, logistics are much more efficient by consolidating deliveries. We have 10 or 20 of the absolute best delivery drivers in the world. We have determined through our census with our customers that the customers value the delivery experience much more than they value the store experience because the delivery experience is much more personal there in your living room, dining room, or bedroom. So we have these 10 or 12 delivery teams that are, have incredible people skills and the customers love them. So after it only took me 32 years to figure it out to have these guys only deliver to you green areas. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Number two, human resources. How do we acquire salespeople fluent in new languages and be friend to other luxury salespeople that may refer their recently re-educated, relocated patrons? For instance, next. 70 percent of the luxury sales in the gallery are made to foreigners moving to or visiting uh, Houston. Half of them are moving to Houston. This is the oil and gas capital of the world. If you go into the Prada store in the gallery, you go into Louis Vuitton, you go into Coach, you're going to uh, all those high-end luxury stores. What you're going to find is Mexican nationals, Middle Easterners, Brazilianers, Chinese, Russians, Venezuelans, Nigerians make up 70% of the volume. I was with a guy named Jose Nueno. He's a uh, marketing guy from uh, ISES, University in Barcelona, Spain. He was taking me on a tour of all these luxury merchants in the gallery, and he was amazed how many people knew me in Houston. So we walked into the Prada store. I'd never been to the Prada store in my life. We walked into Prada. I'm feeling a lot of place. We walked past the manager, and it's this tall, thin uh, uh, 
a lady. And he said, what did you notice about the manager? I said, duh, nothing. <laughs> he said, where is she from? I said, how am I to know? He said, you need to know that. I said, where is she from? He said, she's from Russia. And he asked me, he said, why is she from Russia? I said, I don't know. He said, dummy, that she's from Russia because they have a lot of rich Russian customers in here buying their products. Makes sense, doesn't it? So what we're trying to do with our personnel is get 20 people to speak 20 languages and attract these people that are moving to Houston and buying these $2 million houses with 20% of the furniture. It's $400,000 of furniture. And they're moving in every day. Every day. Next. Texas is the third most popular state for foreign home buyers. They have a home in Nigeria. They have a home in Houston. They need to furnish one in Nigeria with a container full of furniture. They need to buy furniture for one in Houston all the time. Houston, increasingly more diverse, needs staff that speaks up to 20 languages. And that's up to us to go out there and find and recruit top people that can speak the language of the customers. Strategies to find top passionate retail talent. According to Harvard Business School traits of top sellers, 100% acceptance of responsibility for the results. They don't point the finger at somebody else, they live with their own results. Above average ambition and desire to succeed, above average willpower and determination, Intensely goal-oriented, high level of customer empathy, impeccably honest, it doesn't take no attitude, ability to approach strangers even when it's uncomfortable with them. These are uh, attributes of extremely top quality people for our retail environment. Some of the traits are difficult to ascertain during a job interview. A lot of people say experience required translates to we're too lazy to train you. Product knowledge and soft skills can be learned, but they gotta have the gotta want. I have a, there's a gentleman named Robert Flatt, he's an MBA professor at Rice, he brings all the MBA students at Rice to Gallery Furniture once a year, and he has a saying that the main thing to be successful in business is you've got to have gas. And so the first time he said this, I said, Robert, I don't know what gas means. He said, that means you've got to give a shit. <laughs> when we interview people, here's what we ask them. Find out that they have a burning desire to succeed. What was your goal five years ago? Need to achieve it? Why or why not? Great question to ask. What was your goal five years ago? Did you achieve it? Why or why not? To see what the excuses are going to cut, cut, start coming out. We were interviewing a person for a uh, a lady for a, one of our management positions about a month ago, and I asked her. I said, "What was your goal five years ago? Did it come true?" She said, five years ago, she got kind of emotional. She said." They told me my one-year-old child who had birth defects, my one-year-old little girl, would never walk and would never go to school and would never talk. She said, that was my five-year goal. She said, I, put the, uh, I watched that child walk into school singing to herself yesterday in first grade. That's the type of person you want who's going to overcome all the obstacles and find a way. When Hamill arrived in the Alps with all those elephants, they said, you'll never go through through those alpha, those elephants. He said, I will find the way, if not, I'm going to make it the way. Learners, you ask, what did you read in the last 30 days that has had a profound impact on your thinking? And if you're not reading, you're not learning. What have you read in the last 30 days that had a profound impact on your thinking? I'm reading a book right now called The Challenger Sale. It's changed totally the way I think about sales, and I've been in sales for 40 years. The Challenger Sales. Challenge yourself by reading those uh, books and, and educating yourself and turn off my lousy commercials. Next. <laughs> Here's a great Silicon Valley uh, question they ask. The ability to think on your feet. Name as many uses for a brick as you can in 60 seconds. Can you think on your feet? So what difference does it make? as far as your personnel department, about whether you hire top performers, middle level performers, or bottom level performers. Here's the difference. A great salesman at Gallery Furniture works the same hours as a mediocre poor salesperson. They probably take about the same number of customers. A great salesman at Gallery Furniture brings in $7 million a year in, in uh, revenue. They sell high profit items to uh, islands of profit customers. The store makes about $2 million out of this seven. The mediocre salesman does $3 million a year, the store may make $400,000 net profit off of that. The poor salesman does $2 million a year, 
and the store loses a million dollars there. So what we have learned is if we're going to hire a top performer, we have to interview a hundred people to get the one that we want. I think everybody in Texas a and will agree, Johnny Manziel has made a little bit of difference. <laughs> this is a uh, hiring kiosk for a company called Zara. They're a division of Inditex. Uh, they have 7,000 retail stores across the globe. They started in the panhandle of Spain. It'd be like starting a uh, clothing company in Amarillo, Texas. This is their hiring uh, kiosk in a mall in Moscow. <coughs> Lead the globe, be an expert. What we're trying to do is find out where the trends are and hire people who can be trend spotters. How do you look around the corner and see what's coming next? That's the trick of it. How do you look around the corner and see what's coming next? How do you get on the this part of the profitability index when the merchandise is just coming on the scene and you ride the profit wave all the way up the top and you get out and it starts coming down? That's what we're trying to do. Early adopters, pragmatists, conservatives, and laggards. The time for the laggards, you got to get off and get out. Next. So we find a way to identify trends. There's a website, this is a, very much of a uh, paid website called WGSN. They are the worldwide leader in fashion trend forecasting in many different categories. Not the least, least of which we're concerned with, which is home furniture and interiors. It's called Home Build Life Super Window Shop. These people have about a thousand people all over the world that every day are looking for trends. What's coming up and they're looking out. Two years in advance, not one month like I do. They're looking out two years in advance. Emerging lifestyles, a think tank, consumer buying insights for buyers, designers, and retail. What are people buying, not only in Texas, but around the world? You know, the United States used to have the best retail on the planet. The United States no longer has the best retail on the planet. It's in emerging countries where people have new money like China, Brazil, Russia, etc. Uh, what demographics are spending money and on what in your category? What are they spending money on as far as millennials are? Generation X, Generation Y, baby boomers. What are they spending money on? It tells you every day. Expert intelligence on design, lifestyle, and interior trends. Product design and development tool. Use to deliver successful concepts, products, and collections. They see a hot uh, furniture store in Milan, Italy. You know about it the next morning. You can search all articles to see which color is trending next. Uh, you search all articles and pictures on, of blue furniture in the last 18 months or emerald in the last 18 months. I was told by these people two and a half years ago that gray was going to be the hottest color in upholstered furniture. I haven't sold gray in 30 years. I said, you're crazy. Gray is now the new beige. Hello, I miss that trend. <laughs> <laughs> Big picture macro trend ideas like industrial uh, evolution. You know, the, the uh, recycling thing and the restoration hardware, reclaim restoration hardware got on that trend four years ago and they made a ton of money, did a wonderful job of this, developing a great brand because they were ahead of the game. They looked around the corner and they saw what's coming next. Retail analysis. Examines retail marketplaces around the world and shows comp prices on similar items in multiple places. For instance, you can tell them, give me the price on a 48-inch 48 48 square uh, black ottoman that gives you the price in 60 different markets into 60 different stores around the world. Anticipate design trends two years ahead. They attend 80 plus trade shows around the world in 18 different categories for home and interior. 80 different trade shows like the High Point uh, Furniture Market coming up. They go to trade shows all over the world and you learn what's hot, not only in Houston and Texas, but around, around the entire world. More trendsetters. How do we help our employees be trendsetters? Well, the one thing we do to help our employees to be trendsetters is we pay them more. One of the problems in retail is over the last 30 years in American retailing, the average wages of the retail employee has gone down, effective for inflation. And if your employees can't buy what you're selling, it's hard for them to sell. To sell it. They, have, they have no concept of, uh, of doing that. Stanley Marcus said many years ago, the best way to sell a luxury is to... Uh, uh, experience life for yourself. So, uh, we're paying our employees more so they can buy these type of things. Putting Trend Magazine, uh, Architectural Digest Lux in our break rooms so our employees can see what's going on around the world. 
organized trim days workshop with Cobb Trim Center. We're bringing in interior design uh, experts from across the country, across the world, once or twice a year and have a session with all empo our employees to tell them what's trending. Number three, gather slippery information. What shopper expectations are you missing? Create an inform information funnel. What battles were you not able to fight? At Zara, my favorite clothing store, for 30 years when the sales associate wasn't able to make a sale because they didn't have a pink dress for this lady. They sent it to the home office via the computer and from 7,000 locations around the world, they're getting data every day on what, not only what sales they're making, what sales they're missing because they don't have merchandise. Three years ago, some uh, big star in Hollywood wore a pink beret to one of the uh, Academy Awards. The next day, they had 5,000 requests from the Zara salespeople across the world for that pink beret. They had the beret made in the store in four days in four days. That's fast retail. Uh, recruit useful, ambitious, internationally driven coordinators with culture of trend appreciation to be the innovative uh, design people at Gallup Furniture we stay on the cutting edge. Equate trends to merchandise and build excitement. The store has to be excited to give people reason to be here. Next, please. Question five. How do you make the store fresh and exciting? How to merchandise, promote, educate customers to visit the store multiple times a year. At Zara, the average customer of a Zara store in Europe visits the store eight times a year. In the furniture business in the United States, we're lucky to get one visit every three years. If the customer will not drive 200 miles to visit our new store over here in Sugarland, we had not done a very good job of designing and making this store uh, interesting. The store and excited to express them up. Bucky's. What did Bucky's build a brand on? Bathrooms. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible to build a brand on bathrooms and to sell everything in the store at 30% higher margin than the other guy down the street, but they did it, didn't they? And that guy came from Lake Jackson, Texas, giving him credit. What a genius idea. And you can't get in the damn place. Amazing. <laughs> Customers will visit frequently if the product is fashionable and sensitive to change. We want to change 30% of our furniture, decor, and land displays every month. We want it to change 30% change of the store every month. You know what that takes? It takes work. At Zara, 7,000 stores around the globe, six different brands, they change their inventory in the entire store every two weeks. It's unbelievable. Every two weeks they change the inventory. And so they train the buyers. If you see something you like, buy it because you come back in two weeks, it's not going to be here. Maybe that's why the guy at Zara just surpassed Warren Buffett on the richest people on the world list. A retailer from the north, northern peninsula of Spain. Amazing. Next. Store status changes frequently, flash sales, in-store events, etc. Next, please. Store is a destination place to get ideas and for, for gallery furniture. How to transform their homes and interior spaces. Maybe they're not looking to buy, we want them to come out and visit anyway and get some inspiration and make furniture a fashion item, not a commodity item. Next. This is how Zara operates. Zara stores a big box like this. All around the perimeter, they have their high fashion items. There was a hot t-shirt one of their competitors had. They, they send people out every day shopping other stores. They go to discotheques. They go everywhere where there's uh, young people with fashion ideas. And they found this hot t-shirt. They made the t-shirt and have it in 7,000 stores in two days. So the, all the high fashion items are on the outside, the basics are in the middle. Here's how that works next. The high fashion items cost a lot to make because they make them so fast. So they buy it for one and sell it for two. The basic items they sell all the time, they buy it for one and sell it for nine. So it's like a pretty good business proposition to me. 80% of their sales are the basic items. They bring them in on the uh, couture items and they sit on that. What, a, what, a, what an incredible business model. Merchandising. How to get great buyers. I have been the singular buyer at Gallery Furniture the past 32 years. I suck as a buyer. I got to get better, so I'm getting myself out of it. We need buyers who develop suppliers nearby and also travel the world to find the best bargains, produce incredible products that benefits customers and sells for the right margin. We're in the, we're in the process right now of hiring at least 20 buyers. Our best buyer that we have right now is a guy named Roy. He started with me when he was 17 years old. He went to Jeff Davis High School in Houston. 
He had no idea what furniture was. But he started and we, we developed him. One of my kicks at, at gallery furniture, seeing these young kids develop and grab a hold of that free enterprise thing and see that they can make it and they can excel. And that's Roy's story. Right now, he's the best Hollywood furniture buyer in the world. Next. Uh, Roy went up to Holmes County, Ohio. I sent him to visit every one of the lower 48 states trying to find American-made furniture. It was said there's no more uh, furniture going to be made in the United States. We've offshored it all to China. I believe differently, and so did Roy. So he started to search all over the country, and he found a little hamlet called Holmes County, Ohio. Holmes County, Ohio is uh, about 50 miles from Akron, where the Pro Football Hall of Fame is, and is populated by Amish people. They have 300 furniture factories in this one, one county. 300 furniture factories. Here's the normal piece we buy from China, import for $7.99, an entertainment center. Roy designed a solid wood entertainment center over there for $16.99 that we buy from Holmes County, Ohio. We sell five of that to one of these because people like quality and they like Native American products. That's the type of person we're looking at buy an exciting value for the customers. Merchandise. Eventually, 20 buyers sourcing, buying, and developing new products in the United States and around the world. 200 days a year on the road. You gotta get out there on the road, you gotta see what's out there. You gotta love retail. You wanna you gotta wanna make the, the best merchandise in the world for your customers, buyers. Then you go to bed thinking about new merchandise, wake up in the morning thinking about new merchandise, obsessed with finding new merchandise for the customers and help them develop long-term win-win relationships with and with loyalty and trust with key vendors. IKEA is a great example. They have never tried to beat up their vendors. They partner with their vendors. They want to see their vendors be strong and make money. A lot of American retailers beat up the vendors, charge them back to death, and eventually run the vendors out of business. IKEA doesn't do that. If, if IKEA gets to 50% of the volume of vendors' output, they quit doing business with them. They have to have vendors that are strong with other customers. IKEA is an amazing story. They had one skew, one coffee table last year. That one coffee table they sold, 3,500,000 of them around the world. One student. Buyers must be merchants and discoverers. They must have an incurable sense of curiosity and insatiable desire to discover and develop new products. What do the Wright brothers have to do with buying furniture? Everything. Wilbur and Orville Wright were in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They had a crazy idea. They were going to take this contraption and make it fly. And you know they had a different idea than everybody else. Everybody else back then made an airplane and did this. The wings went up and down. It made sense. That's how birds flew. But Orville and Wilbur Wright designed an airplane with a fixed wing on it. And they spent all their money. They had no money. They spent everything, every dime they had on developing uh, this airplane. They never had any line drawings or engineering drawings on the airplane because they knew if they left them in the little shed where they had it, somebody would go in there and steal them. They were in their head their whole life. In their head. So they picked them up with a commercial application for this airplane. So finally the military started looking at the airplane so they could fly it out and scout where the enemy was and come back and tell everybody. So on the first test flight they had one of the big wigs in the U.S. military and one of the Wright brothers on that airplane and he flew him around and showed him, showed him that could go out two miles and come back or whatever. And the airplane propeller failed and hit the wing and the plane crashed down 40 feet out of the air and it killed the military guy and maimed the Wright brother for life. At that point, they could have easily packed it all in. But they didn't. The Wright brothers were prepared for setbacks and now there's 15,000 commercial air flights in the United States every day taken off because the Wright brothers didn't give up. So, one back one. Steve Jobs over there. Everybody knows the story, but did you know the story after he got fired from Apple, the company he started and nurtured and grew? He started another computer company called Next. And he started an animated film company called Pixar. And the problem was that both of them were broke. And he decided to do this one film in Pixar called Toy Story, and it did 300 million in the rest of history. Discoverers, develop new ideas, that's what we're looking for. People develop new products, develop new vendors for us. New frontiers, be a trailblazer. 
Social media is a whole new world, isn't it? I recruited my son James down here to run our social media department, and I gotta tell you, the kid is just terrific. We had discussion forums and blogs, trend spotting, feedback. Uh, other day on Reddit, he got our sleep guy, Brandon, to uh, post up. If you have a sleep problem, talk to me. We thought we'd get 50 posts. We got 1,000 posts in two days. We were the number two trending topic on Reddit on Monday behind Bill Gates. Uh, opinion polls and quick surveys. Customers will tell you in a minute whether they like something or not. You can get lots of uh, crowdsourcing on whether or not they like the furniture. Social media monitoring, traditional online and complementary research, uh, uh, clickstream tracking, etc. This is the pictures we take at High Point uh, Furniture Market. We post the pictures on our website. We let the customers vote for which one they like. They thought they like this one the best. We brought it in, it's been a bestseller for us. All that from crowdsourcing. The other thing we do when they vote for a picture item and the item gets in there and we have their email, we send an email that item's here, come look at it. And all that absolutely free. Lots of stuff on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Pinterest, you name it. Next. Ask Reddit, ask me about anything. Sleep expert Brandon Jackson, incredible number of hits on that and interest on that. Keeps us relevant in the conversation. Next, please. Social media is all about customers. Customer recruitment, feedback, service, retention, ambassadors, reassurance, interest, engagement, motivation, and satisfaction. A whole new world. Next. Big data. What retailers are successfully using IT for competitive advantage, and how are they using those technologies? A great opportunity for all you young people in here. This is where fortunes are going to be made in this country in the next 10 years on the world of big data. McKinsey Global Institute, the number one consulting firm in the world, said in June 2011, the next frontier for innovation, competition, and productivity is big data. They also said, we estimate that retail using data to the fullest has the potential to increase operating margins by more than 60%. Could a company's access to and ability to analyze, analyze data potentially confer more value than a brand? Could big data confer more value than gallery furniture? I spent $150 million building the gallery furniture brand over the past 32 years. I'm on television this market 3,000 times a week, a very well-known brand. But you know, to all those new people who have that new money who just got here from Brazil or China or Russia, they never heard of me. And they're spending all this money on these houses, townhomes, apartments, and furnishing them. And if we could find a way for Big Data to target that, that would be more viable than the gallery furniture brand. Next. That's the gallery furniture brand. Very valuable, big, very valuable Big Data could do it. I gave a speech to the today, so I have to throw in the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good brand, you'd have to say, wouldn't you? Next. Big Data. Big data allows organizations to create highly specific segmentations of tailored products and services precisely to meet those needs. How do we find and target the people who live in Sugarland and Katy and uh, up there in Woodlands? How do we target those people through big data? There's ways you can do that. Retailers can use algorithms to optimize decision processes such as the automatic fine tuning of inventories and pricing in response to real time in store and on online sales. You can do variable pricing, find out where the sweet spot is by looking at the data. What's the variable price? The price of price there will make the maximum profit and get the maximum sell. Kroger, how many of y'all have a Kroger card? Kroger gets their loyalty program through Dunhubby. Dunhubby designed the Kroger loyalty card. Do you know that Kroger sells that data for $100 million a year? They sell the data that they get off their own loyalty cards for $100 million a year. Shows you how important that big data is. And Kroger and Walmart and these big grocery store companies are getting a huge first charter advantage because of the P&Gs and those people of the world are helping them do the big data thing and the independent merchants are getting left out in the cold. A shortage of the analytical and managerial talent necessary to make the most of big data is a significant and pressing challenge and one that companies and policymakers can have been with begin to address in the near term. If you get involved in analytics and big data, the, the world is at your doorstep. Because that's the coming thing. Next. Organizational change in talent. 
Organizational leaders often lack the understanding of the value of big data as well as how to unlock this value. In competitive sectors, this may prove to be an Achilles heel for some companies since their established competitors as well as new entrants are likely to leverage, leverage big data to compete against them. And as we have discussed, many organizations do not have the talent in place to derive insights from big data. In addition, many organizations today do not have structured workflows and incentives in ways that optimize the use of big data to make better decisions and take informed action. And big data is just as important for the public sector as it is for the private sector. It's the coming thing. Next. Gallery purchased four competencies. Sell the island's profit customers, recruit the island's profit customers, recruit new, uh, retain them, and recruit new island's profit customers. <laughs> Five with method, big data, big challenge, big, big return on investment. Next. The question is the future. What's next for gallery furniture? What will gallery furniture look like in five years? As we go totally digital, it's going to be a totally different place. We will have more and more young people, back up one please. We'll have more and more young people like you working inside of gallery furniture. That's what we'll look like in five years. And we'll also have a, uh, incredible website and an incredible store over here in Sugarland that should be our number one store. Next. The question is why? I had enough money at this point in my career to hang it up. I've worked a lot of days over the past 32 years. My wife has too. I'll tell you a secret I'm not proud of. My three children, I told my wife, birth those kids after midnight so I won't miss any word. She did. <laughs> <laughs> why why build a business number one to benefit the community the more profit we make the more we're able to pour back into the community my, my father died of congestive heart failure my brother died of congestive heart failure 500,000 people a year in the United States die of congestive heart failure number one cause of death and so I'm working with Billy Cohn and Daniel Timms and Bud Frazier down at the Texas Heart Institute. And Gallery Furniture is funding the research to develop the world's first totally artificial heart. It's like Kitty Hawk. And this guy, Billy Cohn, is called the Edison of Medicine. And they're moving way along on this thing. It could be the biggest uh, change in medicine in the last 40 years. Benefit the employees. Our goal is to make our employees the highest paid people in furniture retail. Our employees have an invested interest in gallery furniture just like we do. When that building burned down and the people told me to take the money, the $30 million, and, and go to the house, no way, because I was going to help our employees. Our employees are invested in that they built the business. We're here for our employees in the community. Change the world. How do you change the world? You change the world through this thing called free enterprise. You change the world through this thing called the Judeo-Christian, Muslim, whatever you want to call it, work ethic. I think the biggest problem we have in this country is the 14% unemployment. And people that work are alive, and their minds are functioning, and their friends are at work, and work defines us, doesn't it? Work defines us. My daughter Elizabeth uh, had a severe mental illness when she was in the... Seventh grade, they told her she'd never finish high school. She'd be a basket case the rest of her life. She got involved. She had the right people help her. The teachers help her. And now she's getting a Ph.D. in social work from the University of Houston. Good work. <laughs> and the last reason I'm still at this is to leave a legacy. At the end of the day, how will we be measured? The most important thing you'll be measured at is what type of difference did you make in other people's lives? We have a little girl that we adopted many years ago. Her name is Regina. She was my, uh, the nanny for my children. She was her niece. And Regina's uh, father went to the penitentiary for life. Her mother was a crack addict, so the nanny took over Regina's uh, guardianship. And then the nanny went crazy, and they called us four years ago, so they were putting Regina in CPS, so we got CPS to give her to us. The child was nine years old, and she read at a pre-first grade level. Her upbringing was so bad, she got expelled out of the first grade. It's hard to get expelled out of the first grade. She ate ketchup. That's all she ate for two solid years. She couldn't tell time, couldn't make change for a quarter. And now, four years later, uh, Regina's doing better, and she's going to this place in Quincy, Ohio, called Chattic. And, and we're trying to get her life straight, because, you know, you've got to straighten them out before they, it's too late. And uh, Chattic has a wonderful motto. Every child deserves a chance. 
Well, every human being deserves a chance to enjoy this incredible thing we have in Houston and in Texas and in Fort Beaton County called the free enterprise system. So our challenge is to go out there and make business bigger and better and give more people the opportunity to achieve that thing called the American dream because we can do it. Thanks very much. questions, I'm not shy. <laughs> yes, sir. There we go. Jim, uh, your daughter runs the post code store and or a commercial. Is that the daughter that had the illness? Uh, no, my daughter, Laura, is the one on the commercials. Uh, and Liz is too, but Laura predominantly. Laura is uh, a wonderful child. She went to U of H she got, and went to the culinary school at U of H. Her and her husband own the Ben Young Steakhouse in Austin, and she does commercials free of charge for her day. <laughs> yes, sir. I have one for you. Um, I understand that uh, all, a lot of us are in an MBA program. What would you add in your experience to our course that you could see that will benefit us all from your experience? I think analytics are critical. You know, I was out there at Google in Mountain View, California, because we're a big customer, and everybody out there was, um, you know, they, they were predominantly Asians and Indians, and they all had those math and science degrees, and they all had that analytics down. I just think that's such a big thing, that big data, and I would add that to the curriculum and make sure everybody's well-versed in that, because it pays us tremendous dividends. We got a, one, a guy that does analytics for us, and he kept showing me the trending topics on our website. And I'd never done that before. Ten weeks in a row, the number one trending, trending and most looked for item on our website was futons. We didn't even carry futons. Well, we started carrying futons back on that feedback, and now it's the best-selling item for us. So, you know, the data's out there. You just got to make something out of it. Yes, ma'am. I just asked, uh, what if you had a software that could show you exactly the they're from Puerto Rico Exactly who buys it, from what agent, from what demographics. Do you think that would be helpful? The reason I'm asking is because we created a software just for that specific thing. It's all data analytics. For entrepreneurs, just... Well, let me have it. I'll start selling it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know. It's, the whole thing is targeting the right people. Right now, our advertising is called Spray and Pray. Spray the advertising, pray it works, you know. So we're trying to target it more. Yes, sir. How many mentors did you have? Well, my father was my biggest mentor, and uh, uh, he died in February this year. And he was 90 years old, had 600 people at the funeral. And they told stories I didn't even know about him. And he uh, was an amazing man and left an incredible legacy not only on the family, but on so many other people, and that's uh, my inspiration. Uh, Dr. Deming has been my mentor, and uh, recently this guy, Jonathan Burns, has been a great mentor to me, and so I, I, I use a lot of people and try to see what I can learn from everybody, but I think there's, there's learning to be had from uh, all these people that have really paid their dues in whatever discipline they're in. My daughter, Elizabeth, has been a great mentor to me. Yes, ma'am. I would think the guy that fired from the grocery store would be a mentor to The guy that fired from the grocery store, yeah, he did me a big favor. He <laughs> kicked me out. I wasn't very good at second anyway. Yes, sir. How many uh, TV channels that's not in England that have you outside with? Not enough. Um, we do a lot of Spanish TV. We do uh, some, uh, uh, a little bit of Nigerian TV, but we need to. We need to, on our website, we need to put all these different languages up there and start appealing to Vietnamese and Chinese and all these other diverse uh, people and so we can speak in their language and get them to our store. That guy from China, maybe we may just start you know, watching Chinese channel here because all the guys on there are probably going to watch the Spanish. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Yes, sir. Was there ever a point where you considered another profession other than being an entrepreneur and what was it? 
Oh, well, you know, the first 10 years, it was all in the day of survival. And uh, the, the song in my head was One More Night. Could we last one more night? And, uh, you know, when it, the, the big discipline was making payroll every Friday. And that was a, a challenge. So, uh, but I always liked the furniture business. I liked the fact that uh, I had the ability to influence the lives of a lot of these young people. And, uh, you know, I draw so much energy from those customers. We had a lady up there the other day, and she was, uh, she had her, she had three kids she's raising. Uh, her daughter was the mother of these three children, and 11 years ago, her daughter was murdered by uh, her husband. Uh, and so she took custody of these three kids. It was just horrific, and she wanted to start a new life for them, so she got a new house. And came out and bought like $14,000 worth of furniture from us. She remembered how nice I was to this child. So they came out and spent more money and spent all day at the store. And just things like that make retail worth, worth doing. You know, retail is nice holidays and weekends. And you got to love it. And I love interacting with those customers. Yes, ma'am. I know you've done a lot of great things in the community. Um, some that I, I mean, probably one of you even know. Is there any one thing that you first feel like coming out of your legacy working that you wanted anything else to let you know for? Uh, we, we, we do a lot of funding for mental illness, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a disease my daughter had and still has. We would like to, uh, my wife and I, before we leave this earth, to help her eliminate that disease. And we would like to have the, um, that uh, continuous flow of heart done where people can get heart transplants like we get hip transplants. And if we could do those things, then we'd left a, a health legacy. Yeah, I got it right back in the back. Then. Yes, sir. Question. I think you may have answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What, what, two parts. What is your greatest joy? And the other part is what keeps you up at night? Good question. Uh, a bad mattress. <laughs>
full-blooded American Indian and a Hispanic guy. His name was Frank Medina. He was the athletic trainer at the University of Texas. He was four foot eleven, and he was uh, he was a holy terror. And that team won 30 straight games, two consecutive national championships. I was on the team. I got to tell you, I was a great football player at the University of Texas. I only had two small problems. Number one, I was too small. Number two, I was too slow. The position I played was called the bench. But anyway, I was <laughs> Frank Benita taught me one thing I remember the rest of my life. Ask, take, and give no quarter. So you never got any tattoo there. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, well, certainly you started off, in, as you mentioned, that there were only 30 businesses in your line of work. Compared to then and now, obviously the competition is not just local, but it's international, uh-huh. if not national. How would you recommend for a new entrepreneur that would be on a small scale business? Well, data analytics obviously is a big go, but that requires a lot of cost. I, I, small business, how would you recommend? then starting off and be able to maintain that competitive edge in the market. First thing I do, I read this book called The Challenger Sale. I would read that book and it teaches you how to sell. And any entrepreneur is going to have to sell something, you know. you got, you got to get in the door, you got to make the sale. Then I find a niche that's very profitable and I specialize in that niche and grow and grow and grow and reinvest all the money in the business. And, and, and keep the overhead low, you know. That overhead low, you can focus on the customers, not on the, the bank is knocking on the door. So keep the overhead low, find the find niche, and find something that makes a nice margin on it. The Challenger Sale. The Challenger Sale, great book. Yes, ma'am. If someone has an idea for expanding your social media program, where would they start with that? Uh, start with that, my son, James. Okay. And uh, he's, he's been terrific. He's taken our... Facebook from 1,200 people to 30,000 or something, and he's, he's done a great job with it. They respond to everybody on Facebook who talks to me within 30 seconds. The only problem is I'm in front of the store. They say, hey, I talked to you on Facebook yesterday. Yeah, how you doing? <laughs>
and now we're going to come up with a look, and that's something we're really struggling with, but we'll, we'll work our way through it. You know, the idea is you can close your eyes, open your eyes anywhere in the store and know where you're at. When you can do that, then you got it. And uh, so that's what we're working on. The, uh, uh, we have monkeys, we have parrots, and uh, all sorts of things. And uh, I always introduce the customers to the monkey. I say, that's our board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Yes, sir. And something else from a marketing standpoint. I've always seen the company attack itself to sports very, very well. I got a bunch of gold. Uh, you, you seem to have you know, great idea, concept of how Texas sports is doing. Super Bowl, if you buy something and you get the winner, you get it for free. Where, where does this come from besides yourself? And has that been successful for you? Uh, the the t t tagging along with the sports marketing has been very successful. Now that the brand is so so strong, we're, we're not doing as much. We're doing more of the data-driven stuff, targeting the exact customers. So certainly the sports market with the Astros and the Rockets and the uh, Texans and the uh, college football games helped establish us. And, uh, you know, I, I've uh, always been a big sports fan myself, so it was fun for us. Now we're moving on to the more data-driven things. Having sales like with this economy right now, which one do you have the higher sales, the high end tickets or the lower? Uh, we have found that the affluent customer base is is spending a much bigger proportion on home furniture. Uh, Twenty percent of the population spends sixty percent of the dollars, so that's where the dollars are, and that's where we're going to, uh, you know, be targeting a little bit more upper end than we have before, and we're not going to abandon any of our customers like JCPenney's did, but we're going to make it a gradual transition.